Good evening, hi, and welcome here to the second in our series about the Penguin Green Ideas. And I couldn't be more happy tonight than to be welcoming Bill McGibbon to 5 by 15 and to us um, with his book in this series, which is called An Idea Can Go Extinct, which is an extremely intriguing title, which we're obviously going to talk about. Now, Bill, as you probably well know, he first book was called The End of Nature, which was probably one of the first really big general books about the environment. He went on to found the organization called 350.org. He also launched the fossil fuel divestment programs and somehow found the time to write a dozen or so books, including a novel. In 2014, Bill received the Right Livelihood Award, which is the sort of environmental equivalent of the Nobel, and no one could have more deserved it. Now, all of you will, of course, have noticed that are, we are starting a little bit late. And the reason we're starting late is that Bill is joining us from Washington DC where he has been involved in a week long protest. And I think he's going to tell us in a minute that he's planning on getting arrested tomorrow morning. So before we start talking about this book, which by the way, you can buy at any good bookstore through our bookstore for just $4.99. Um, and uh, before we start, also just to tell you that this is a 45 minute session, it is recorded. And please put questions in the Q&A box because we'll only talk for maybe half an hour and then hopefully bring you all in. But Bill, first of all, big welcome here. Thank you so much for being with us. And just tell us what you're doing in Washington right now. Well, Rosie, first of all, such a pleasure to be with you and get to say thanks for all the work that you've done over the years. And second of all, um, you're very patient to uh, to bear with my crazy schedule. Yes, this week is a big uh, gathering in DC called People Versus Fossil Fuels. It's been organized by indigenous campaigners across America who have asked the rest of us to be here in support. It's especially focused on a couple of these big pipeline projects that are being built across native lands. Um, and tomorrow, uh, some of us will be outside the White House uh, getting arrested, which actually is um, brings back strong memories for me because it was exactly 10 years ago, almost to the month, that we were getting arrested outside the White House to mark the beginning of the fight against the Keystone Pipeline, which became kind of the or environmental battle in the states over the last decade, a battle that we've won. Uh, uh, but you know, you can win battles and still lose the war. So uh, uh, on we go with with, with this fight. Um, it's really powerful to see the leadership coming from frontline communities and indigenous communities, not just here, but really around the world, all the places that I work, uh, that's where the energy is. And it's one of the best things that's happened in this movement in the last 10 or 15 years. Yes, I think that that's absolutely right. And you, you certainly see all the signs of more and more people clamoring for more and more action, which we can come on and talk about in a bit. But let's, let's start with your book. I mean, this is a very intriguing idea. An idea can go extinct. And I know it comes from the end of nature, which you wrote 30 years ago. And of course, it was a very strange. I, I read it on the beach. It's a bit sort of um, a bit runkled. But <laughs> I, I felt that I was reading it. You could have written it yesterday. And that made mm. me feel both uh, extremely engaged in the idea, but also quite sad because you did write it yes. some time ago. So can you tell us yes, what, what it means in an idea going extinct? I sure can. Um, so yes, this was the first book about climate change for a general audience. And it came out in 1989, which seems like a long time ago now. Uh, and for me, it's very odd because talking about it means being in conversation with my 28 year old self, you know, because um, that's how old I was when I wrote it. And um, Part of the book, The End of Nature, was just the sort of first reporting about the science behind the climate, behind what we now call climate change, what we then called the greenhouse effect. But part of it was a kind of almost philosophical treatment of, of uh, what it meant uh, to be, what it would feel like to live on a world that was being manipulated to that extent by human action. Um, maybe it was a kind of early case of what we now call climate anxiety or, or whatever, but I was more, I was less fearful and more sad and sad about the idea that really it was no longer possible 
to look at any place on the planet and say, this is wild, this is untouched by human beings, that we were changing the temperature and hence the flora and the fauna and every other part of the dynamic about every square meter of the planet was for me um, horribly sad. Now in the 30 years since, you know, one, it's become obvious that there are even better reasons to be sad, like millions of people dying, having to leave their homes and things. But in 1989, because this was still all in the future, we were making predictions. Uh, in some ways, it was there was a kind of um, abstract quality to it. And that melancholy, um, um, that sadness, and the anger that it was beginning to produce in me uh, really have been the, the mainsprings of uh, my, um, you know, sort of lifelong work in trying to somehow head off the fate that I was predicting back in the 1980s. So I'm really interested in this, the idea of an idea. And I mean, we discuss a lot in sort of legal terms, you know, what is your baseline that you, for instance, if you try to work out biodiversity loss, where do you start? I mean, there's a lot of people like my generation will say, oh, I remember being a kid and driving around on a summer's night and the window screen would get full of insects. And of course mm. you drive around now and there's no insects. So it's a very kind of clear <laughs> thing that in my lifetime I can see. But of course, everyone's baseline shifts. and. When I read your book, I think, where is your baseline that, and why do we, why do, what is the, the point in the sense of the idea? Why is it so important? Yes, it's a very, it's, it's just the right question. Um, so you have to remember partly that, that there's something American about this book in, in the sense that the New World retained a kind of sense of wildness uh, uh, for a very long time. Um, you know, Thoreau, who was one of my heroes, uh, wrote once that he could walk a half hour from his house and come to a place where no man stands from one year's end to another. And there, consequently, politics are not for politics or but the cigar smoke of a man. Well, I, the quote I love, um, I, you know, I, I was living when I wrote this, all of this, I was living in uh, deep in the wilderness, the Adirondack wilderness uh, near the Canadian border. Very, very wild place. I could walk places five minutes walk from my house where I don't think anybody but me has ever stood any human being. But if the temperature of that place is changing and the seasons are shifting and so on, the idea that there's anything really wild about it anymore is kind of an illusion. And, and um, it's, it's sad to start to lose that. The world begins to feel a more crowded place at some level, uh, impossible to escape politics no matter where we go. Um, um, remember this was before the internet uh, and before Twitter and Facebook. So we still had the idea that it might be possible to escape politics for five minutes at some time in your life. Um, and, and, and so it was, it struck me very powerfully as a loss that would then presage a lot of other losses, the actual loss of land, the loss of our ability to make a living, you know, livelihood on farmland, the uh, loss of species, the, you know, on and on and on. Uh, you know, it's very clear that the damage of climate crisis is taken out on those who did the least to cause it. You know, the iron law of global warming is the less you did to fill the atmosphere with carbon, the sooner and harder you get hit. But at some deep and ineffable level, it, it, it is an attack on all of us. Uh, and all of us are paying price for uh, a, a world that, um, well, a world in which we've become so large that we overshadow everything around us all the time. And you, you write about also the, the whole thing of national parks, that there is a level of the Disneyfication of nature, which I thought was really interesting. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's possible to, um, one of the things we do in the world is we start to, if, as we start to lose things, is we start to put them in museums, you know, of one mm -hmm. kind or another. Um, they become a little less living and a little more <laughs> on the wall. 
and um, 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 that happens with the natural world too, um, um, as we struggle to. And and thank God we do. You know, I mean, it, it, it's a very good thing that we have places that we've tried to set aside. But of course, you know, you can't really set a place aside in the world that we live in now. Uh, Yellowstone Park, uh, you know, was America's first national park, but the bear and the bison don't live there because they understand that they're contributing to the Wyoming and Montana tourist economy. They live there because the temperature's right for the stuff they want to eat. And mm -hmm. if the temperature goes up a couple of degrees as it has, they're going to try and move north. And to do it, they're going to have to cross highways and roads and settlements, and, and, and that'll be that. And, and we're seeing that already. We're of course seeing it even more tragically with human beings, watching millions upon millions of people already on the move around the world with no choice but to leave their home. And uh, the role of climate change as the great disruptor of all lives, all vulnerable lives is, is becomes clearer with each passing month, I think. So one of the things that interested me a lot about this, this thing of the idea of nature and why it's so important is the way that we've all, um, well, I think, certainly in my case, and I know a lot of other people, but the fact that we have things like Yellowstone and that we have all this massive amount of documentaries about wildlife somehow has mm. lulled people for a very long time <laughs> into thinking that actually things are fine. And I, I did talk to someone who worked on one of the BBC nature programmes and they said that sometimes they had to really work hard to try to get the animal in a place that looked like it was a natural environment. So there was tremendous faith that happens. Who's doing that to us? Well, you know, the, I, I read recently that the average uh, uh, American or Brit sees more lions on TV in the course of a year than there are left alive in the wild, you know. Um, um, uh, yes, it's, it, it's, um, uh, 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 it's remarkable to pull back the camera a little bit and, and realize that the abundance that we still think is out there really for the most part isn't. I'm always struck by this uh, when I go to Alaska, which is the one place in the North American continent that uh, retains some of that extraordinary fecundity, um, you know, where there are salmon by the millions and bears wandering around and things. And, and when we look at it, we think, oh, well, Alaska is a place of extraordinary natural abundance. But in fact, every place was Alaska at a certain point. Uh, the Hudson River estuary was probably the richest estuary on earth, far more abundant than Alaska because it was in a temperate, you know, climate. Um, 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 it's just that every other place is, is depauperate now, you know, uh, it, it, it's, um, it, it, humans have taken up so much of the space that there's very little space left for anything else. And, and that's, um, that should be a reminder to us, you know. Um, uh, I think that the, I think that human beings haven't yet quite caught up to the idea of how big we are, because for most of human history we were pretty small uh, and tossed around by the world around us. And it was really only probably with the invention of nuclear weapons in the middle of the 20th century that we suddenly our stature suddenly <laughs> began to shift. I mean, it was Oppenheimer watching the first atomic explosion at Alamogordo in New Mexico, who quoted from the Gita, said, we are become, mm -hmm. uh, as gods, destroyers of worlds. Well, the, the image of those mushroom clouds was, thank God, enough to keep us from uh, repeating that experiment so far, you know. Um, um, but the, the, the human imagination proved better at imagining a few big explosions than on understanding that the explosions of billions of pistons in billions of cylinders every second of every day could also wreck the world. But that's just what's happened. That's why there's uh, half as much sea ice in the summer Arctic. That's why the jet stream and the Gulf Stream have begun to waver and flicker. That's why the sea level is now rising fast. That's why last week 
a, a town in Italy broke every European rainfall record with seven inches of rain in an hour. Uh, you know, that's why there are people by their millions on the move ahead of deserts and rising sea levels on their Asian Delta farms, on and on and on. So one of the questions you posit in the book is about whether actually this change is a part of nature, whether it, in fact this is in the same way that change has been happening for a very long time and over eons. Is this all part of some I don't know, we're doing it, aren't we? Well, and there's two parts to that the question, human yes. Impact is to do it and to burn it or whatever it is. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, so that's a really interesting question about the degree to which humans are just another natural force, you know? Um, and at some level, we clearly are. And at some level, there's clearly something different about us too, um, because we could be choosing not to do this. The, the, the crisis that we're kicking off is the biggest event on Earth since the big asteroids hit uh, 70, 80 million years ago. But in this case, the asteroid is us. You know, it's us that has dug up millions of years of biology and set it on fire in the course of a few decades. Um, uh, and we don't have to do it. We could be choosing to do otherwise because we have the technology to do otherwise, um, but we're not making that choice yet. And and so I don't know what that means about us. I don't know whether it excuses us or whether it condemns us even more harshly. Where do you see the effects of, again, you talk about it, about Christianity and the, the whole line in Genesis, you know, did God give us dominion or did he in fact say to care for it. I mean, where do you see the role of religion? Because you also then, the second part of this question is that feeling that God is nature, which I think most people probably listening to this and who read your books absolutely subscribe to. So I think there's no question that a kind of idea about human dominion and things was part and parcel with a lot of the way in which uh, Christianity developed. I'll add, however, that we seem to have done a pretty comprehensive job of dismantling nature, even in those parts of the world that didn't fall under the uh, uh, you know, Christian ethos. Um, and if, if there's good news, it's that increasingly uh, uh, the faiths are becoming uh, important bulwarks in the fight to do something about this. Uh, this morning in front of the White House, there were hundreds of faith leaders from around the US were arrested in, in, in this protest. Um, you know, it's pretty clear to me that there's no more effective nor radical uh, environmentalist in the world today than Pope Francis, yep. whose Laudato Si was the most thoroughgoing critique of modernity that anyone's written this century. Um, so uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's as with all, it's all huge human stories, a mixed one, uh, but at the moment, um, it, 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 you know, it, at least in some quarters, it's one of the places where we're fighting back against what really is the, the scourge, it seems to me, it, the idea that uh, this sort of hyper individualistic idea about human beings that really, really is a fairly modern invention. I mean, in my lifetime, it's really come to prominence and power uh, in my country with Ronald Reagan, in your country with Margaret Thatcher. I mean, really, there was no more powerful or, to my mind, vile thing than anyone's ever said than when she said, there's no such thing as a society. There are only individual men and women, you know. Um, um, that kind of Ayn Randian uh, take on the world is precisely what's allowed us to build a society where polluters go essentially unregulated, where you, you, you know things like climate change are allowed to happen, even though we'd been given ample and fair warning by the world scientific community, it wasn't enough to overcome the extraordinary power of this industry and their determination to preserve their business model at all costs. And absolutely, we cannot get to climate stability without climate justice, but when you see the kind of forces of quote big money against it how do you how do you do you work now in fossil fuel divestment funds do you see that making a big difference 
Yes, that's been one of the most effective campaigns that, you know, when we started the fossil fuel divestment campaign, it was nine years ago, I guess. Um, Naomi Klein and I sort of launched this campaign. And at the time it was very small. The first in 2012, the only, the first person, the first group to divest was a tiny college in rural Maine with an $8 million endowment. Well, we're now at $15 trillion in endowments and portfolios that have divested. It's the largest campaign of its kind in history. Extraordinary thanks, especially in the UK to remarkable people like People and Planet who have mm -hmm. done a great job of making sure that more than half the universities in the UK, yeah. including Oxford and Cambridge, have divested. But now we're talking about huge pension funds pulling hundreds of billions of dollars at a stroke out of the fossil fuel industry. Shell, in their annual report a couple of years ago, said that divestment had become a material risk to its business, which is good because Shell's business is a material risk to life on planet Earth, you know? Um, so. It's been very exciting to watch that and now to see it extending to the banks and insurance companies and asset managers that are the kind of financial lifeline to this industry. And increasingly we're taking on them with success as well. The only problem here is that it all has to happen so damn fast. Unlike the other political problems that we have where we have a lifetime to solve them and then we pass on the struggle to those who follow us and things. Climate change is a time test. Um, winning slowly on climate is just a different way of losing. Uh, nobody has a plan for how you refreeze the Arctic once you've melted it, you know? So, so that's why it seems so urgent and why it's so dangerous. If we don't win fast, we won't win. So when you set up 350.org, what did you feel like the day when we passed it? Well, we'd already oh, passed it by the time we set it up. Oh, had you? Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Um, because, you know, one of the points we were trying to get across is simply that uh, uh, this is um, this negotiation that we're carrying on in the end isn't really between, you know, industry and environmentalists or, you know, labor and conservatives or something, those are all real, but the real negotiation is between human beings and physics. And, and physics doesn't compromise and it doesn't negotiate and we simply have to obey its dictates. In this case, to get back as soon as we can to an atmosphere of 350 parts per million CO2 or, or, or less, which is the only one that we have any experience of working for, for our, our planet. So uh, uh, it was, sad and difficult from the beginning. And there were people who said, don't take this name because it's too depressing. But to me, it was more like, you know, if you go to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, if you keep eating like this, someday your cholesterol will be too high. You know, most people don't pay much attention. But if you go to the doctor and the doctor says, holds up this sheaf of papers and says, well, you know what? Uh, your cholesterol is in the red zone, and I think you may have already had a small stroke, you know. That's the day when you say, well, what pill do I take, doc, you know, uh, uh, tell me what to do. And, and I think that's been one of the reasons why the organizing has been so powerful over the last decade, from 350, from Extinction Rebellion, from the Sunrise Movement, from Fridays for the Future, from everybody else, because it's very clear now what trouble we're in. I'll just add, that the, you know, the work at 350 began with uh, young people. It was myself and seven college students that started it. And it was the first iteration of a global grassroots climate campaign. Young people are doing their job. What we desperately need is for older people to do theirs. And the work that I'm mostly engaged in now, this new organization we're starting called Third Act, is about trying to bring people over the age of 60 in to really play their part. Because it's not okay to just, you know, I mean, I love Greta Thunberg. She's one of my favorite people on the entire planet. And I adore working with her and all the other 10,000 Greta Thunbergs that there are around the planet. But it's really not okay for the rest of us to just say, okay, high school students, you solve this problem. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, we've got most of the political and economic power still, and we best use it or else we're going to be the first generations that leave the planet a much worse place than we found it. So what are your um, aspirations for the climate talks coming up? Are you optimistic? Well, 
I think a lot of it actually hinges on what happens here in DC over the next little while. If the US Congress gets it together to pass this plan of Biden's, which is actually pretty powerful, mm -hmm. um, then John Kerry will arrive in Glasgow with some ammunition in his pocket. If he doesn't, if the Congress doesn't do it, if the oil companies win, uh, then John Kerry gets there kind of naked and it's hard to see how he's able to apply much leverage to anybody else. Um, so I, I don't know. I think it's gonna be really important that we work, that, that we push hard to get the thing that was promised a decade ago, this $100 billion in climate finance from the global north to the global south. And that we begin to get this topic of loss and damage uh, uh, compensation for those places and people who are already been damaged by climate change through no fault of their own. So those will be two of the things that, but the biggest question will be, can we get countries to up their ambition in powerful ways? And I, I think we don't know yet. There have been a few good signs. The Chinese announcement last week that they were ending financing for new coal projects may be a kind of breakthrough moment we shall see. Can you just for the sake of, um... Uh, me and our, the British audience, just explain what it is that Biden's trying to pass in this package. He's trying to pass sort of, this, sort of this version of a Green New Deal. Uh, they're not calling it that, they're calling it the Build Back Better Plan. Mm -hmm. But it's a huge piece of progressive legislation, really that harkens back not to Obama or Clinton, but back to Lyndon Johnson or Franklin Roosevelt in its scale and scope. And it, it, you know, so there's a lot of very important things around climate, but also around healthcare and education and a building a working society in all ways. Um, it's getting scaled down now, and you know, a few senators, one or two Democratic senators, who are refusing to go along. Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who uh, seems to be emerging effectively as the prime minister of the United States, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the woman from Arizona. Kristen Sinema, who enigmatically is throwing up obstacles to progress. But uh, it's been remarkable to watch how far we've gotten, mostly on the back of people like Bernie Sanders, pushing for real change. And there are people doing the same thing in the UK, you know, mm -hmm. uh, wonderful leaders like Fatima Ibrahim, mm -hmm. who are talking about a Green New Deal for the UK. Um, um, and, and one of the very good things about these movements is the way that we're able to cross borders pretty easily and fertilize ideas pretty easily. 350.org has organized rallies in every country on earth except North Korea. So, I mean, that's a kind of sign of the, the global scale of, of how this is working now. Um, before we come to the questions from the audience, um, one of the, the things that I was reading on your, um, your wonderful blog today um, in your website about tree planting and you mm. come up with it in the book and you, you, did, you put in a horrific picture of firefighters having to put tinfoil around the trunks of the big redwoods to try to save them from future fires. But there's so many reasons why a lot of these tree planting schemes, which I have to say here in Britain, it's like all guns blazing to plant as many trees mm -hmm. wherever you can put a tree, that a tree is the answer to all our prayers and all our tomorrows. And to, to start to say that there's a problem with this new tree <laughs> planting is sort of almost heretical. So it was very, very <laughs> interesting what, what you said about how they, well, there have been a few big new studies, Rosie, of these big tree planting campaigns that governments have undertaken and, if, and places like India, and they've just found that they're not working the way that they were supposed to. The trees are often dying. Uh, and, and anyway, people are counting kind of the wrong thing. The, the total number of trees is not the really important thing. The more we know about forestry, the more we understand that it's older, bigger trees that store incredible amounts of carbon. And that means, among other things, that we should be working hardest to stop cutting down trees. And if I had one request for people in the UK, it would be to do what you can to shut down this Drax plant in Yorkshire, the big biomass burning plant. That's, that's putting more carbon into the atmosphere than if they were burning coal in that thing. It's not 
renewable or sustainable in any time frame that matters for climate change. And it's a perfect example of environmental racism because the trees that they're cutting are coming out of uh, 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 poor parts of the American Southeast. Uh, it, 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 it's a um, it's a canker and and should be shut down as fast as possible. Well, there's quite a good campaign against Drax, so I'll, yes. I'll, I'll find out more and get you updated, but it would be yes. a good goal to get the Oh, I love people. the people who are doing that work over there. It's really That's powerful. Very good. Okay, some questions that are coming in from our audience, and thank you all so much for still being with us. It's um, Greg Jan says, can wealthier countries really replace all of the fossil fuel energy they're presently using with wind and solar? Is there enough lithium and rare earth minerals to allow for that? at reasonable economic and environmental costs. Rather, won't we also need to substantially change agriculture, plus even implement some degrowth too? I completely agree about yes, maybe, agriculture. Yes, maybe to some of all of that. It, 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 it is true, however, that the, the single most helpful thing that's happened over the last decade is the truly radical fall in the price of solar power and wind power. Um, to the point where it's now the cheapest uh, form of power on the planet and getting cheaper with each passing year. There was a big study two weeks ago from the Martin School at Oxford uh, that explained in great detail uh, why it is that the sooner we and faster we make this transition, the better, just in purely economic terms. Forget about the cost of climate change, which will obviously bankrupt the problem, the planet, even without that, uh, this is becoming so cheap to generate power this way that we would save tens of trillions of dollars by making a rapid shift. Now, all these things, no such thing as a free lunch. And the questioner is really right to be thinking about things like how we mine lithium and rare earth minerals. There's probably enough of them, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be mined in an environmentally sound way or in a way that respects human rights. And so we need to work hard to make that happen. And it should be a big part of what we're doing right now, but it can't be allowed to slow down any more than it absolutely has to, the rollout of this stuff. Even if you didn't care about climate change at all, the data about what fossil fuels do to people is mm. incredible. Uh, there's a study earlier this year, big, big study, that found that 8.7 million humans die each year from breathing the combustion products of fossil fuel, the particulates that they put in the air. Uh, that 8.7 million people, that's about one in five deaths on this planet. It's more than HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. It's way, way more people than died of COVID around the world last year. Uh, so, and it's all of the poorest people, you know? So it, it's, it's incredibly important to move fast on, on this transition to renewables, and we can do it uh, uh, because the price has come down so fast. It would also be a good idea to think long and hard about what we want out of our economies and our lives. I wrote a book years ago called Deep Economy that tries to really grapple with these questions around growth and what it means for us and so on. But I think it's really important to make use of the gifts that we've been given. Um, yes, I, th I think that's really, really interesting. Um, Roger Dardner says, how would you assess the chances of arresting fossil fuel subsidies at COP or thereafter? I'm very interested in that question because we're still in Britain, we're shelling out a massive amount yeah. still in subsidies in lots yeah. of different hidden ways. Yep. <laughs> um, this is something that a lot of us have been working on for a decade now. We've gotten everybody, all the G20 countries have made a promise that they will stop their fossil fuel subsidies, but nobody does it. And this is just a question of power. The point of building this big movement around climate change was mostly to have some power to counterbalance the incredible power of the fossil fuel industry. And we're getting to that point now. We're getting to the point where it's almost an even match. You know, mm -hmm. We're able to call the question in Congress or in Parliament, but not yet able to carry the question. And fossil fuel subsidies is a perfect example of that. Joe Manchin said the other day that he wouldn't allow them to remove the fossil fuel subsidies 
in this bill before Congress. So it looks like it may be a while before we're able to do that most obvious thing in the US. He comes from the biggest coal state in the country. Uh, so it's no wonder that he's carrying water for these guys. Yeah. Um, Tony Edwards asks, how can we communicate better about to ordinary busy people who don't know much about the climate crisis while not being deniers? Well, the good news is that most people have now figured this out. Uh, even in the US, which is the heartland of you know, uh, obstinance here, we're at about 70% of Americans who understand that we face a serious problem and want government to do something about it. The 70% in America these days of people agreeing on anything is a lot, you know? And it's partly because we've built movements and it's partly because mother nature is a hell of an educator. And, you know, enough times when you have to lock yourself in your house because of wildfire smoke or something, mm -hmm. at a certain point, you begin to just, okay, I get it. Um, the, I think the key thing is not trying to convert the remaining skeptics. It's trying to turn some percentage of those concerned people into active people. Uh, and we need to keep building bigger movements in order to, as I say, balance more effectively the power of the status quo. Um, and, and that's doable. Uh, um, you know, uh, it means talking to people about things they care about. That's why we're doing this work with people over the age of 60, talking a lot about kids and grandkids and about legacy. It's why young people are talking so much about their own futures. Um, you know, it's why uh, there have been these strong links between the social justice movements and the climate movement uh, in order to help people understand that the things they care about uh, in terms of justice are exquisitely dependent on an operating planet. It's why there's been so much work around faith groups and climate, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, on and on and on, people are seeking every wedge in that they can to get inside people's psyches and help activate them. Do you find that it's um, peculiar, because I, mean, I certainly do, that we are able as a species to be able to react to COVID so quickly, and yet we cannot really yet, as politicians anyway, react to climate change? Well, the difference is um, there's not a trillion dollar industry whose business model requires that we all die from COVID. Uh, if, if there were, we'd be in big trouble. I mean, what we know now is that, you know, back when I wrote The End of Nature, from which this book, this new book is drawn, in 1989, you know, most people and politicians were ready to go to work. The Republican president of the United States, George H.W. Bush, said, we will fight the greenhouse effect with the White House effect, you know? Um, and then, and then the fossil fuel industry, as we now know from great reporting, who knew everything there was to know about climate change, uh, embarked on this huge effort at disinformation. They hired the people who used to work for the tobacco industry, and they spent billions of dollars building out this architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation. And they poisoned the waters to the point where it became, well, where we spent 30 years in a completely fake debate about whether or not global warming was real. Both sides having known the answer to that question at the start, uh, just one of them willing to lie. And that big lie was a big deal. It cost us the one thing we couldn't afford to lose, which was time. Yeah. Um, from Roger Doudner again, the recent shortages of coal in China, India and elsewhere, are they bona fide shortages or is this a manufactured crisis a pushback from the fossil fuel industry? And if uh, they're real, what does that forebode for renewables? Well, one doesn't, one doesn't really know, but we're at a moment, obviously, of transition right now and transitions are bumpy. There's the transition coming out of the pandemic, and there's the transition going into the renewable economy, where people are less willing to invest in fossil fuel because they know it has a very limited lifespan, and, and yet we haven't quite built the infrastructure out that we need. That's why we need things like the Build Back Better bill and you know, plans from uh, all governments to build these things out. So it's going to be a bumpy and rough period for a while. Um, and our hope has got to be that as we emerge, 
it will speed, not retard, the progress towards a, a, a solar and wind economy. So something I was uh, listening to earlier today, which was a uh, think I think a group called Aim High, which is doing um, sort of teachings on climate change, was extremely interesting about how the the targets we have, like we must do half in ten years or whatever, are guesstimates, and how that is a very difficult thing to bring up against politicians. That the, with the best science in the world, you don't understand where the big tipping points are exactly going to be. And that politicians can always use that, so to speak, wobbly bit. Uh, and they did a really interesting graph of, you know, someone pushing a boulder uphill and how far is the boulder and at what point does the boulder go over the top? Well, the answer is no one quite knows. And yes. it's in that no one quite knows that all the people that will oppose or possibly oppose Joe Biden's new thing, they, they can a lot of people can live there. Yes, that's true. But, you know, at some deeper level, and this is the real tragedy here, we've known everything there was to know back to the 1980s. You know, there's mm -hmm. not a thing that I wrote in that book in 1989 uh, that wasn't obvious, you know, what wasn't already pretty obvious. Um, and, and yes, there's been immense attempts to defy reality, uh, most of them funded by the fossil fuel industry. And that's a great tragedy. But reality has a way of asserting itself. And the scientists have done a beautiful job of giving us the guidance that we need were we to heed it. Most recently, the IPCC mm -hmm. has told us that we have to cut emissions in half by 2030 to have any hope of meeting the targets we set in Paris. So that's a deadline and a target. And they're quite specific and they're also quite difficult. Uh, 2030 is eight years and change away now. Um, so we've got our marching orders. The question is whether we're gonna march or, or are we gonna just sit on our hands? So we've got only time really for one more question, which is about from Mali, about 360 dog all ever going to stand behind and embrace the rights of nature? I don't actually completely understand the, the question. I think it may be a reference to this work that people are doing in various countries to um, uh, uh, enshrine the rights of nature as a legal precept uh, that would be actionable in court, which strikes me as a very smart idea. And I've gotten to work with lots of people who are doing uh, work along these lines. The only thing I'd caution is that uh, uh, I wouldn't put um, all my faith in a legal strategy at this point, because, because all these questions, including legal ones, uh, uh, turn on questions of power. That's ultimately how politics works. And the goal is to have more of it than the bad guys. And that means organizing, building movements, uh, uh, getting more people together and out in the street. We're getting there. We're getting there. The question, and it's the question on which the future hangs, is will we get there in time? How fast can we make this happen? And we don't know the answer. It's one of the things that makes this dramatic. You know, most questions we have a long, we have some time to solve. Dr. King used to end his speeches by saying, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yeah. This may take a while, but we're gonna win. Well, the arc of the physical universe is short and it bends toward heat. If we don't win soon, we don't win. And that's the challenge. So if anyone's been keeping their powder dry, now's the moment, friends. Well, that's an incredibly good note to end on. Um, so thank you. Um, so thank you very much. This is the second of the series that we've done um, after our event with Jared Diamond. I hope we're going to be bringing you lots more. Please read this, it's incredibly good. I'm so pleased to meet you. I've been a fan of yours for so long. Well, and Audio likewise, books. and, and no. I would say, uh, Rosie, what a great interview. Your long career as a journalist, among other things, is very much in evidence. And that was a well, great series really of illuminating questions. Shush. Um, I could have gone on for ages, but thank you all to all our people who, who stayed. And um, Bill, um, we'll be in touch about the third act because I have some ideas. All right, good. I can't I wait to hear it.
Okay, of thank course. you very much. And thank you to all our listeners. And we'll see you very soon. And uh, yeah, 